So Arnold, you're, you're known for being one of the most intense individuals in the gym. Did that fire just click on when you walked in the gym every day or was it, did it take a few sets to get to that point or were you ready to rock as soon as you walked in the door? Well, you know, because I was so enthusiastic about, you know, achieving my vision and turning my vision into reality and uh, winning one championship after the next, there was always excitement and enthusiasm there. So when I went into the gym, I put my gym bag down and I immediately attacked the weights. There was no, I mean, many times we started out by doing maybe uh, three, four, five minutes of ab work in the beginning to warm up, you know, to do maybe uh, 500 uh, Roman chair sit-ups or something like that to warm up. And then we got right into it or we go right into the, the whole thing. But I mean, it was right away warm up set, then the next weight up, next weight up, boom, boom, all the way to the top until you just can't do it. And supersetting, everything was always supersetting, 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 and uh, three pump sets and four sets in a row, five sets in a row. So it really it changed in what exercise we did, but it was always all out. And like I said, the training partner was always responsible to challenge you at all times. So that was the thing. I challenged my training partners, if it was Frank Zane, if it was Dave Draper, if it was Sergio Liver, whoever it was, the training partner was in any given moment, we challenged each other, kind of in a fun way, but I mean, there was challenge just so that you don't slack off, so you don't give yourself a break. So one of the things that you made popular was the supersets and tri-setting, and uh, surprisingly enough, there's a lot of kids in the gym nowadays that don't even do those things. So what makes the difference in the workout when you add those variables? I mean, it makes the pump completely different, correct? Well, it makes the, the pump uh, completely different, but it also the, the muscle responds differently if you do a pushing exercise and a pulling exercise. Let's say, for instance, with bench press and with chin-ups. So it was always, it worked much better when we did a set of bench press and immediately after that went to the chin-up bar and did a set of chin-ups. By that time, the pectoral muscle has rested. So now it's time again to go back and do the bench press. First of all, you train twice as fast. And number two, it's a better pump. It, the muscle responds better to that. You get more definition and muscle separation by doing that. So it really worked well. And sometimes we even not just did a superset, but did, we did three, four sets. And I mean, I was training with, uh, with uh, Sergio Liver. And Sergio Liver in Chicago, when I worked out with him in 1969, he was doing like four sets in a row. It was kind, kind of common practice. And so I said to myself, I was doing like three sets in a row that was common practice for me. So he actually pushed me to do four sets and to think beyond and to do five, because he trained with Bob Guider, who used to do six sets in a row. So, so I, it, it opened up a whole new thing for me, just like Reg Park did when it comes to calf raises, where I did always like with 300 pound calf raises and 400 pound calf raises, but all of a sudden I saw Reg Park doing with 1,000 pound calf raises. And I said, oh my God, it is, I never even thought about that, you know, that is humanly passable. And then I pushed myself to go up to that level. So, I mean, this is what it is. You got to push yourself all the time because remember, the body doesn't really respond to the same thing over and over. But you got to always give it the extra punch. So I think supersets and triple sets and quadruple sets and all of those kind of things create that kind of extra fire in the muscle. Well, and that's one of the things we're creating by this Blueprint series is to bring back the volume training. A lot of people have gotten away from it because they think they're overtraining. So what do you have to say about that? Well, I think that uh, I liked to be a little bit overtrained because to me, I responded better and I got more definition because remember, in my days, we were not as sophisticated when it comes to dieting, uh, and we didn't have the food supplements that are available today with getting definition and you know cutting down and all those things. We had food supplements that were really good for gaining weight, but we didn't really have much available to lose weight. So to me, my way of really getting defined and getting kind of a really mature definition, rather than just dropping quickly 10 pounds or 15 pounds with a watermelon diet or something like that, which just, you know, depletes your body from all the fluid. Mm -hmm. But then you get cramps on stage when you pose and then also in the gym and so So that's not the right way to go. So I always felt like if I do instead of 20 sets, 30 sets, 35 sets a body part. So I went all out, especially before competition when I wanted to cut down. It was to, to pile on as many sets as possible because remember that after you do the bench press and you do the incline press and the dumbbell incline press and the flies with the dumbbells and all this stuff, now you still have to do the dips for the lower pectoral muscle. Then you have to do the 
the exercise for the striation. So now you do cable crosses in front. So now you're already at 30 sets, yeah. right? And then you, you haven't even talked about, it, about the pullover with the dumbbell, which was my, as you remember, we talked about that, oh. my favorite exercise to lie across the bench and to have a heavy dumbbell, like 100, 120 pound dumbbell, and to do like 15 reps of that to get great serratus, to expand your ribcage and all those things. So yes, you were tired. Yes, I had to come back for the second workout at night, but so what? So what? I mean, it's still not as bad as working in a coal mine at 1,500 feet down below the ground and get a dollar a day like they have done in South Africa when I went down to the Visit Ridge Park. Yep. That was terrible work. Yeah. Working out in the gym five hours a day, you know, it's, 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 I never felt sorry for myself. Let me tell you that it, was, it all paid off. Absolutely. So you're a pretty big guy, obviously. So 245 doing pull-ups and the volume that you did pull-ups, because a lot of people just say, oh, well, I'm too heavy for that. That's for a light guy or not. But talk about the difference it makes doing the wide pull-ups or the taper, the close ones that you and Franco used to do all the time. Tell them how key that is in the program. Well, I think that if you, first of all, all exercises that you do with your own body weight are great. If it is sit-ups, if it is leg raises, if it is dips, if it is chin-ups, all of those things are terrific. So I'm a big believer in that. I think chin-ups, when you weigh 240 pounds, you ought to have the strength of a 240-pound guy, right? And if you weigh 180, like Franco, of course he did chin-ups easier, but he was pound for pound stronger than me. Yep. So that's why it was easier for him. He put around his waist sometimes 40 pounds, a 45-pound plate, and he did chin-ups, like nothing. You know, and I put on around my waist 20 pounds and I was struggling with the 20 pounds. So, but we did it because it was the only way to really open up those wings, the shoulder blades and the lats and really create the width because lats is not for thickness of the back. Let's not fool ourselves here. Mm -hmm. It is all for width. Yep. I mean, as you remember, Steve Reeves, he did a lot of chin-ups and a lot of pull-downs and he got this enormous wide back, but he didn't have much thickness because he was not a big believer in rowing. So the rowing exercises, mm -hmm. if it's T-bar rowing or one-arm rowing or wide grip rowing with the barbell, all of those exercises or cable rowing, all those exercises are specifically for the thickness of the back. And then you can direct it if it should be lower, it should be higher, it should be more in the center, more in the outside, and all of those things depending on what exercise you do. When you were key for mind-muscle connection, so when you were, uh, you know, I saw lots of clips when you're training biceps, you're flexing them in between, you're looking at the, the pose in the mirror, like talk about when somebody's training, what, what should they be thinking about when they're working that muscle, how they should be squeezing, and should they be paying more attention than they probably are? I think the biggest mistake is that you go to the gym and you go through the motion, but you don't really have your mind inside the muscle. So when you do a bicep curl, I can't just stand there like this. Yeah, you can. I've seen the guys training with me also four hours a day, five hours a day, but they look like shit. And why did they look like shit? Is because they didn't concentrate. They did the same exercise, but they went, they stood like this and they looked sideways, kind of like they were bored because they didn't even know why they were training, that they were not inside the bicep or inside that lat when you do the rowing and you pull back and you flex the, 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 the upper back and the center back and then you let it down and you stretch it and you think about that the wing is coming out now or like a curtain is opening up. You know, we always thought about the curtain, right? This is when we did our lat spread. So you got to think about those things. When you do calf raises and I do my donkey calf raises, I got to be inside the calves and to make them split, to make them open up when those guys sit on top of it. You know, first three guys, then I have one guy jump off and it be two guys, then I have another guy jump off and then there's one guy left on, on my back sitting and doing donkey races. You know, some people looked at this, this guy doing some kinky singing. But anyway, there was <laughs> something else that was the strangers they didn't know what we were doing. But I, I tell you, you got to be inside the muscle. The same is when you do chest. I mean, when, I, when I'm finished with the bench press, immediately I step in front of the, the, the mirror and I flex. I hit the shot, I want to see everything, how it works, right? And the same is with the cable crosses, when you do afterwards cable crosses. I want to always see what happens. And therefore, it goes to another subject, which is posing. Posing is so much part of training that you should never do an exercise without hitting a pose right afterwards. If you do a chin up, why not hit the back pose? When you do um, a chest exercise, why not do the chest exercise, a, a chest pose or a most muscular pose? 
When you do a bicep exercise, why not hit a bicep pose? I mean, that is always part of it. So posing throughout your training is absolutely essential, besides just the posing training afterwards that you have to do anyway, at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes. But the more you pose, and the longer you hold your poses, the more you control you're going to have on stage. And this is why so many of the bodybuilders are having a difficult time on the stage to pull in their stomach. They have a difficult time to have the energy to go through a one hour pose off on stage or two hours of pose off on stage. Then they're wiped out and their stomach is hanging out there, walking around. How can I ask, how can I vote for this guy to be the winner of the Arnold's Classic or to be the winner of the Mr. Olympia when he cannot even handle a pose off? when he's already running out of steam. So this is why I think to practice this and to pose, to be inside with your mind, inside the muscle, and to go all out, to combine training with posing, I think is absolutely essential. It kind of moves to the topic of visualization, because as you're seeing it in the mirror, you're pumping it, you're watching it, that's part of it, you're talking about the calves splitting apart, those are all things that you were visualizing as they were happening. And, so you can, and also you have to feel it. Yeah. The key thing is, is that, that you visualize it, but you have to feel the muscles. That's the key thing, because then they grow. Because that is our, our only way that you really can push beyond, besides doing the shocking principle, mm -hmm. which is a key principle before competition, which is where you uh, kind of shock the muscles and you always kind of hit them with a new way of training. Uh, but besides that, the posing and the pushing beyond the limit and doing the four straps is really the way that you can then get defined and can kind of tune in to the day of the competition so you get that extra definition, so you get the extra muscle separation, so you get that extra sharpness that you maybe did not have three months before. So nowadays you see guys in the gym and I don't even think they can call these rest periods. They're texting on their cell phone, they're talking to their buddy. What was the rest periods like back then or was it just drink of water and let's get rolling? How did you guys do that? I think that we had very little rest periods simply because of the super setting and the triple setting and all this. Um, and we pushed each other all the time. So imagine that you have a situation where I take a barbell and I'm doing now my 10 reps. And now I give it to you, right? You're standing right in front of me. You're my training partner. So I give it to you. It means that don't put it down because that's the rule, right? <laughs> yeah. So I give it to you. Now you do your 10 reps. Well, I, after your 10 reps, I got to take the barbell again. I cannot walk away to the water fountain because otherwise I'm going to act like a loser. Yeah. So I'm definitely not like a training partner. Yeah. So now I have to take the barbell again and I do the 10 reps. Yep. But after I'm finished, I give it to you and now you have to deal with it. And you have to decide this is how it went back and forth. And your arms felt like falling off. Afterwards, we, had to, we put the arm up here because it was hurting so much. We put it up here, that, that hurt. Then we were just letting it hang down. That hurt, then we put it back up again. It, it, no matter where you put it, it hurt. But that was great because that means that the muscle got it, that it was just shocked. That up until that point, maybe we were dumbbell, doing dumbbell curls or barbell curls and put the bar back on the rack. But now all of a sudden we were handing it to each other, which is part of the chalking method that I was talking about. That you use the last months before the competition or before you want to really be in your ultimate shape. You shock the muscle all the time with unusual things. And one of them is to, to do the, the hand the barbell back and forth. Another one is to go down the rack from 110 pounds we did in dumbbell presses to 100 pounds to 90 pounds to 80 pounds, so all the way to 40. And then we did lateral raises with the 40 pounds. And then we did bend over lateral raises with, before we ever put it down. You know what I'm saying? So now the shoulders were so pumped up and it was screaming, but that's how you shock the muscle. And we did this with all the muscles. So rest is for losers. Rest is good, but I mean, only <laughs> enough yeah, to, to next recuperate quickly and to do the next set or to concentrate. You know, sometimes you sit there on the bench when you have four or five on it and you really want to focus and you think about your chest and about the pectoral muscles and then you lean back and then you do the set. So here's a little rest, but it is not the kind of a rest where I go and make a phone call. If I would have made a phone call, they would have taken me right out of my zone. And when you get into that zone, when you go inside the gymnasium and you start working out with your training buddies, you cannot get out of that zone because otherwise it's very hard to get back into the zone 
And on top of it, you're basically saying, look, I don't really care if I have destroyed my worker just now, but I have to make this phone call. Why? I mean, there was a famous story with Jim Lorimer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard that story, when he called me to compete in the Mr. World competition in 1970 in Columbus, Ohio here. And uh, I got to the phone, he said, you know, there's Jim Norman on the phone, he wants to talk to you about something very important about the World Championship in bodybuilding. And I said, hello, this is Jim Lorama. I want to talk to you. I said, look, call me back in an hour. Bye. And they hung up. <laughs> so then Jim Lorama called back, Gord's Jim, in an hour. And that's when I talked to him. And that's when we arranged everything for me to compete in the famous Mr. World competition where I beat the first time Sergio Liver, and which made me then meet Jim Lorama and then become his partner. And then since then, for 40 years, we've been running bodybuilding competitions together. But it started out by me rejecting basically his phone call. He said, hey, call me back, and I hung up, because I was in the zone. I could not deal with anything at that moment. So this is the, the difference. So this is why when I see guys texting, they're not serious. Exactly. Yeah, this is Mickey Mouse stuff, you know? You train or you don't. You know, it's like in Germany, we say, venschon, denschon. If you do something, then do it. Go all out. So we haven't, you know, we touched on cardio a little bit. You talked about maybe doing uh, cardio a few days a week, doing some running with Franco on the beach post-workout. It's not really a thing that's uh, been written a lot about you. So, you know, you also talked about doing some lunging and things like that. So let's talk a little bit about the conditioning stuff. So you would train your ass off for two hours in the gym on your first session. Then would you guys head out and just knock out a couple miles and just kind of tighten up a little bit for contests? Or how did you guys do that back it, then? It was really, uh, you know, because we never really looked at it as an important part of training, we never talked much about it. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is we did it all the time. We, Frank and I, we would drive down San Vicente Boulevard on the way to, uh, to the gym, and we would, he would just pull over on the side. And I said, what are you doing? He says, hey, let's just run 10 blocks down and 10 back, and then uh, you know, continue driving. So th that was just kind of like in a, on the way to the gym. Gotcha. And then when we were finished working out, we would always go and say, hey, let's go down to the beach and run in the sand. So we would be going two miles in the sand, but imagine how oh, hard yeah. that is when you run in the sand. And this is something that we have, of course, picked up because way back, uh, Reg Park and Steve Reeves apparently did a lot of their walking and running in the sand in order to lengthen their calves. And I wanted to lengthen my calves, so that was part of the, the whole calf routine, even though it was meant to be to train the heart and to do some cardiovascular work. We also went bicycling a lot of times, for hours at the time. So there was a lot of cardiovascular work we've done, but I think it has a lot to do with it also because I come from soccer and Franco came from the boxing background. So he always loved the jumping rope and to do all those kind of exercises and a lot of running. And he pushed me therefore also to participate in the running and I pushed him. So obviously arms, arms were one of your favorite things to train. It's well documented. What's your favorite arm superset? If you only got to do one, you had to pick one bicep and one tricep exercise superset, what would they be? I would do a, a barbell curl with an easy curl bar. I would say that's kind of like, uh, would be the most basic exercise. And I think it's something that everyone would grow if they would do a barbell curl that is, you know, done uh, in the beginning very strict. And then when it gets heavier, heavier, with a little cheating. And then when it gets really heavy, more cheating. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But Barbell curl is the most basic exercise. I think it's the first exercise that I've done when I joined the weightlifting club because we had only very few dumbbells and we had mostly barbells, so everyone trained with barbells. If it's barbell uh, curls, if it is uh, barbell triceps, if it's barbell bend over rowing, everything was barbell, barbell, barbell. What was your best barbell curl? It's like 275. 275, I did uh, three or four reps on, on stage. There was always one of the things that you did in my days. You had to show that you had the strength also. So when you did an exhibition, you did deadlifts and bench press and curls mm -hmm. and stuff like that on stage before you went out there and post. What would be your go-to tricep exercise then? Uh, my favorite was a triceps extension with a cable, you know, just pressing down. Mm -hmm. That one worked for me the best, but I have to say that people shouldn't really pay much attention to that because everyone has a different kind of a build. 
There's people that are getting a much better triceps exercise if they do one arm triceps, like Frank Zane was one of them, they did one arm triceps extensions behind the neck and he pumped up like crazy with that exercise. To me, it was a good exercise, but not the best exercise. To me, the, the, the regular push down on the cable was a much better, uh, much better exercise and a much more effective exercise. So one thing that we're putting in this phase is some front squatting. So let's talk about like during contest time why you would do front squats. I obviously did back squats also, but throwing those in the mix a little bit more often. Did you feel like it gave you more leg development around your kneecap or what, what was your purpose of that? Well, I, I cannot even imagine to just do one exercise or two exercises. I mean, as, a, as you know, with chest, I did five, six exercises. And the same is with legs. I mean, you know, I did my uh, back squats, but because of the very nature that I have, uh, a long legs, I leaned always forward more than maybe other people like Frank. Frank would be totally straight up and down when yeah. he did his squats, and I always leaned forward more, which meant it went more into the lower back. So it was yeah. a little bit of thighs and a little bit of lower back, so it was kind of a split. So therefore, in order to make up for that, I did front squats. Because there I had to hold the weight in front, I had to look up and to go totally straight down, so therefore I could train the outer thighs. The same was again also when we did hack squats. I'd be at a great machine in coach gym where we did hack squats in that machine. Leg presses was also one of those great machines. So I altered many times in the end to finish off my leg training with a, you know, a, a, a kind of a hack squat or a leg press exercise and then with a combination of leg cross and leg extensions. So that's what, it was usually always five exercises that we did for the legs minimum. So this is definitely the hardest part for people is to stay on a diet. But do you believe it maybe that the part of the reason why they can't stay on their diet is because their vision isn't in check or their why isn't right? I mean, because that all ties together. You said it didn't matter to you because you were eating what you needed to eat for your goal. Right. So when people say to me, oh, Corey, I don't know how you do that, getting ready for your cover, your magazine, or whatever, I don't even think about it because I just eat what I know is going to give me the result. But how do we tell them to kind of have that same mindset is it, you know, so how, how can we help them be better when they're watching this and they're saying, as soon as I, I'm going to download the blueprint and I'm going to change and I'm going to transform myself. What, what is your, what is your, uh, how could you help them? Well, to me is, is what are you more hungry for? It's really the question. Yeah. This was always my question. Am I more hungry to be Mr. Olympia? Or do, am I more hungry to eat like everyone else out there and therefore look like everyone else? But that was my question. You know, to me, I was more hungry to win Mr. Olympia, and I was more hungry and more interested, more excited about the fact of becoming a champion and being ripped on stage and being cut and winning the trophy and all those kind of things. Because I knew that if I would just, you know, have a temporary joy here and eat and cheat, I am most likely not going to make it. That someone else is going to walk right by me and someone else is going to grab that title. Because many times these competitions were very, very close. And I remember, especially in 1980, where it was just two points. And, uh, you know, any mistake could have cost me the title. So this is not a mistake that I want to make. I want to be responsible that I do everything that I can to be a winner and to get the body that I envision. And uh, from then on, if I lose, which I have, uh, you know, I lost against Sergio, I lost against Frank Zanzer, then it was not because I screwed up. It was just because they were better. And then I need another year, or I need another two years, or whatever. But the worst thing is, is that if you lose a competition, or if you're not quite reaching your goal because you didn't do everything that you could do. And this is why I say to people, I said, you know, think about that twice, you know, before you grab something else. Stay on your diet, stay focused, and when you have that question, if you are about to eat and cheat, uh, so think about what the goal is, and this is going to help you get to your goal. That's how you can check. The other thing, of course, is, is when you have training partners, like we went, it was, we had a habit of after we trained at Gold's Gym that we would go and all go and have lunch together. I usually would invite and uh, take the whole gang uh, for lunch and celebrate the great work that we had, but we would watch each other. Yes, people would have steak and a hamburger patty and all this, but if someone had the bread with the hamburger patty, we would bust them right then and there. So if we were helping each other, again, this is the responsibility, I think, of a training partner that you help each other, even though may, you may compete against each other. But still, it's the responsibility of a training partner. But always think about, in the end, what is your goal? 
what is your vision, where do you want to go, and does this screw up now, uh, or, or, or this you know, kind of um, need to having some fattening food, is this going to help you? There were times where Franco and I felt like we were so ready and we were so ripped in compared to the others that we knew that we were going to have the competition in our bag. I mean, it was just something that we felt. So we would go like a week before and celebrate that. We would go to the house of pies. Before you won. Before we won. <laughs> and we would celebrate, said, you know, that there's no one that's going to be. We have seen now Lou Fering, we've seen Ken Wall, we've seen Frank Sang, we've seen Dave Trepp, we've seen all those guys, you know, and, uh, you know, Sergio, who was always the biggest danger, he's out now. Yeah. So he's not coming back. So I knew, so we would go to the house of pies and we would order literally an entire pie just to, to do the opposite of what I just said. And you just, you know, just stuff our face with this, uh, you know, cherry pie that was our yeah. favorite. And we would just stuff it with whipped cream on it and stuff like that, and then we would walk out. And then we felt, of course, guilty again. And, uh, but that, that is something that we uh, occasionally did uh, a week before competition. But throughout the three months of training before the competition, we were in usually very, very strict. So, what are the three things that created urgency in your training that took your mindset to that championship level? Well, for me, the most important thing always is to have a deadline. Uh, so, uh, when I, for instance, uh, had a competition, and let's say the competition was in the middle of September, and it was now beginning of summer, so there was no more time to screw around. So there was the time now to get uh, going on a diet, to get going with the training, to not slack off at all because there was a deadline there. The day of the competition, I had to be in the best shape possible. And I knew that uh, if I come to the competition and I lose because I did not schedule my training the proper way, or I didn't have the right frame of mind, or I didn't give everything, literally worked my butt off, I would be just so angry. So I never wanted to be in that situation. So this is why it was very important to pick that time and to say, this is when I have to be in top shape, and then I work towards that. But it's not just with the competition. I mean, it's the same in the movie business. I mean, to me, it was always a big advantage when I said, okay, my movie starts on April 1, and I have now three months, so I have to get really in great shape. So you pick those times. It could also be that you have no movie and you have no Mr. Olympia or no Mr. America, no Mr. Universe coming up or any of those things. But you say to yourself, the summer starts in June. I'm going to go to the beach in June. And at that time, I want to be in great shape. So that creates an urgency that makes you really start training hard and taking it seriously. Because if you don't have a specific plan, then you wander around. I mean, you can have, as I've told you many times, the best ship or the best plane in the world. But if you don't have a specific goal where you want to go and when you want to get there, you just drift around and you never get anywhere. So this is why it is so important to create that urgency and have a specific time when you want to be in shape. Well, your purpose is obviously known for wanting to look like Rich Park and be the greatest bodybuilder, but what advice would you give somebody that's meandering through life and they're like, I, I want to change, but I, they said I don't know where to start. What, what would you tell them? The most important thing is that you have a vision, that you have a goal. Because without that vision and without that goal, again, you're drifting around and you're never going to end up anywhere. People don't become successful just by accident. You know, I mean, maybe the guy... Uh, that found gold in California and started the gold rush, but don't count on that. That's the one in a, in a lifetime kind of a situation. So you got to really have a specific goal. And to me, to have that vision that I want to be Mr. Universe, that I want to be the greatest bodybuilder of all time, that was a great vision and that specifically to look like Reg Park and to be up there on that stage and to lift the trophy overhead and to win the championship over and over and over again. So that was a great goal. You have to have a goal. Now, it doesn't have to be that specific goal, but it has to have some goal. This is why I always recommend to people, sit down, take your time, and start thinking about why do you want to work out? What is your goal? And then it can't be as crazy as it is. It, it could be, uh, you know, I want to impress girls. If that's your goal, so be it. But it motivates you. It could be that you're emulating a certain, uh, you know, bodybuilder or a certain football player, a certain boxer, whatever it is. Have those pictures 
put all over the wall like I did when I was a kid. I put pictures of Rich Park and of Sonny Liston, of uh, boxers and of Ali and of powerlifters and weightlifters all over my bedroom, uh, you know, uh, wall. So that every day when I go to sleep, every day when I wake up, I look at those pictures and they motivate me. You need that motivation and then therefore you have this kind of imprint in front of you all the time and you know exactly what you're chasing. And this is why I always smiled when I was in the gym. People always came up to me and said, why are you smiling? You're working out five hours a day. You're doing the same as the other guys, but the other guys have a sour face. They're pissed off that they have to do another rep or another set or something. I looked forward to, I looked forward to another thousand set, uh, reps of, of sit-ups. I looked forward to another 500 pounds of, of, of uh, leg press or squat. I looked forward to doing more and more curls until my arms fall off. Why? Because I knew that every rep that I did and every set that I did and more weights that I lifted, I get one step closer to turning that vision into reality. So I was turned on by that. I was excited. I couldn't wait to get to the gym. You know, one of the things of, uh, you know, creating urgency, it can go, you know, one way or the other. Because like, I remember that when I weighed 245 uh, pounds, and Bob Rafelson, the director of Stay Hungry, said to me that I'm interested in having you come in for reading and work on your acting and all this because I'm interested in having you in a movie to star with uh, Jeff Bridges and with Sally Fields. I was delighted about that and I was excited and I started pumping up more and more. And then he said, but I don't want you to weigh more than 210 pounds. So I said, well, I said, well I, <laughs> it's funny you come to me and <laughs> you want me to be in a movie, but I'm weighing 245, 246. I said, I just want the Olympia. I say in 19, which was 1974, and I was really at my biggest. And, uh, but he demanded that, and he says, look, it's very simple. On the day we start shooting, he says, I'm gonna put you on a scale, and if you don't make the 210, you're out, because I have someone else in mind. And I worked on it, I started visualizing myself very clearly as a lean athlete because that's the only way I could lose that weight and all of a sudden get interested in running more. Because up until that point, I ran like three miles after training or before training or whatever. But now all of a sudden it was five miles, six miles, seven miles, eight miles. And they even ran mini marathons in order to lose the weight. And I did everything with high reps. And I was watching my diet, what I eat and all those kind of things. And by the day, the day before, I remember we were in Birmingham, Alabama. The day before I was at the YMCA with Bob Rafelson. He was swimming and I was working out and I was running. There was a track there and I was running. He says, let's step on the scale. And I stepped on the scale and I weighed 209. So it just shows you what is possible if you visualize exactly what you want to look like. So it can go one way, which is that you can lose weight and get trim and get slim and everything, get the abs out and all this. Or you go the other way and you gain weight because you see yourself big and you see yourself as a winner of a Mr. Olympia or something like that. So it can go either way. But in, in, in it, what, what happened to me that year was very interesting because I had to drop the weight to 210. And then after I was finished with Stay Hungry, I decided that I go back into the Olympia because I actually, in my mind, retired in 1974. But because George Butler uh, and Charles Gaines came to me and says, we're gonna do Pumping Iron, not only the, you know, the book that we have that was very successful, but we want to do a documentary. And we want you to be in it, and otherwise it doesn't work, we needed you to be in it. So I said, okay, good. I started training again, and I only had three months now from the time I weighed 210 to go back up again. I didn't make the 240 anymore. I only made 232, 233 in 1975, but I won the Mr. Olympia again, and this was what Pumping Iron was all about and so on. But in each case, it was like certain time limits were set and I had to perform, and there was no room for any kind of like, well, I can't get my act together or anything like this, because there's only a certain amount of time. But the key thing again is have the clear vision have the specific goal of what you want to accomplish because then you never go to the gym and you say, the day I feel down a little bit, I don't know what it is all about, I don't know my life, I'm confused, no. Because that means that you haven't even set up your training partner because Franco Colombo, who was my training partner, was responsible if I just blinked that he said, well, 
Let's pump up the day. The day I challenge you to a bench press competition. Let's see if you can beat a 180 pound little guy. Let's see, and he would, he would know how to push the buttons because that's what the responsibility of a training partner is. So I, whenever people say, how can he be successful in bodybuilding or in lifting or in sports or in this, that, I always believe 100% in a training partner because a training partner is helping you when you have your moments where you're down and then the other person is up. So Franco was pushing me when I was down, I was pushing him when he was down. That was the responsibility of a training partner. What would you tell somebody that says, I'm just not very confident, I want to start this training program, but I want to build confidence like, like you display? Well, I tell you that I was a perfect example of someone that was not confident at all. I mean, when I was a kid, that was just like any other kid. I had my hangups and problems and all this. But when I joined the weightlifting club, and I won my first little trophy because I did the best clean jerk. And then we went to another meet and I won another little trophy. I started feeling like somebody. I started feeling like when I lifted the weight, and pound, put it over, over my head, put it over my head, this weight, I saw the people, this 100 people that were in a beer hall, usually those weightlifting meets were in a beer hall, they were getting up and they were screaming because I was the 16-year-old kid. I was the youngest on the weightlifting team. And so they were cheering me on because I was this young kid that was performing well. So I was getting little trophies and then bigger trophies. And all of a sudden, I started really feeling like, wow, you know, I'm somebody and I can lift this weight and I actually can be a pretty good weightlifter. But actually, you know, everyone is saying that, Donald, you're gaining so much weight and so much mass. I mean, you're gonna go far, I'm telling you. you. You could win the Austrian Championship in no time and you could win the European Championship. You should, I hope you're taking it seriously in order. So I said to myself, wow, if everyone says that, I feel really good. So I started gaining confidence. So that's how it was. Then all of a sudden I won the junior Mr. Europe and then I won the Mr. Europe and then second Mr. Universe. So by that time, now I was 19 years old. I had over 20 inch arms. Everyone in London, when I arrived at the Mr. Universe contest and I was 19 years old, they were standing outside the hotel and saying, oh, here he is, this is the guy. So how can you not feel special? So, and of course not everyone is gonna have this kind of a situation, but the bottom line is, Everyone can use the same method because I used it in politics, I used it in making money, I used it in everything that I've done in the movie business. When you have one little victory, you do one little movie. I remember when I did with uh, Lucille Ball, Happy Anniversary and Goodbye. Uh, it was just a seven minute scene, but she said to me, she says, you did fantastic, Arnold. And in front of a live audience, you did this TV show, you were not scared, you just acted really well. I was totally believing everything that you said. It built me up. It was a little thing like that, that that gave me the confidence and then to do streets of San Francisco and stay hungry and pumping iron and Conan the Barbarian. So it led from one little thing to the next. It's adding up what you said is exactly right. Little victories add up and that is what gives you then ultimately confidence. i tell you another example just quickly because it's something totally different. Public speaking. I would have been scared to do what Reg Park did. He always, after he posed, he went to the microphone and says, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this great applause and it's wonderful to be back in Leeds, England. It's my hometown and blah, blah, blah. And he kept on going on for 15 minutes. And I'm looking at this and I said to myself, he, had, he didn't have a piece of paper in front of him. How could he speak like that for 15 minutes? And so I said to him afterwards, I said, I'm in awe that you can speak like that and, and, you know, when, and you're scared when you go out there, there was like 2,000 people out there. And he said to me, no, 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 not at all. And he all of a sudden connected. And the next day when we did another posing exhibition in Newcastle, he had me come out. He says, oh, before I leave, I just want to bring out again my, my very, very good friend here and training partner now, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's 19 years old. Come and welcome him with a big applause. And they all were applauding, so I had no choice. I'm not standing backstage, right? Because I just watched him pose and I'm watching everything that Reg Park does because I'm emulating him and I want to copy everything that he does. Well, all of a sudden I had to go out. And then he put the microphone in front of me and he said to me, he says, so tell them, you know, that you like, you know, a new castle. And I said to him, 
And he said, yeah, yeah, talk, you can, you can talk. Say, I like Newcastle. And they said, I like Newcastle. And they all applauded. <laughs> Imagine just you know, this, this little a few lines and, and they all applauded. So then he says, he says, he says, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And as I was out there and he was feeding me lines, I started feeling more confident. And then all of a sudden I realized that there was no one out there trying to kill me because I'm speaking. But in fact, it is a bigger fear factor for people to speak publicly than anything else. So here is an example, little things, incremental things of him feeding me lines and stuff like that. A year later, two years later, it got bigger, the speeches got bigger, and I started feeling comfortable being in front of a microphone, and the rest is history. I never was scared again doing public speaking or anything else because of those moments. What's like um, a couple of challenges you ran into um, on a regular basis and how you dealt with them? Well, I mean, look, everyone has a problem with time, but the day has 24 hours and we sleep six. Now, I know there are some out there that say, whoa, 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 I need eight. Well, I say just sleep a little faster because the bottom line is we have six hours of sleep, 24 hours are available, so you have 18 hours now available to your work, your family, your hobbies, and also to learn something new or to do something new, which could easily be that you want to learn a new language or that you want to read as a, a you know, newest resolution, I have to read a book every week, uh, or you say, I'm gonna go and reshape my body. So you're gonna go and take this hour out of your schedule and say, I'm gonna train an hour every day. So this is for most people a, hu a huge challenge, but it is totally doable, I can tell them, because the kind of things that I did when I came to this country, I mean, I went to school, I was working in construction, I was working out my five hours a day, I was taking acting classes from eight o'clock at night to 12 midnight, I was doing all of those things. I wanted to make sure that out of the 24 hours of the day, that I don't waste one single hour. Those hours were too precious. And so there I just want to tell people, don't give me this thing, I have a difficult time with the time and I don't have time for this and I don't have that. You have time, you make the time. When the President of the United States has time to work out, when the Pope has time to work out, then you have time to work out. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.